The Lord is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning and welcome. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Pastor Micah Drengler. Serving as our preacher today is Pastor Doug Dahmer. We are so glad you could join us. Members, welcome home. Any guests and visitors, a special welcome. Those joining us online, welcome. The victory is no less yours in Jesus Christ. We're here to celebrate Easter today, to celebrate the resurrection. Following this service, the celebrations continue. If you want the party to keep going after we say amen today, head that way for food. If you're small, we've got an Easter egg hunt out there. Uh, we would love for you to join us for that. But don't let me get in Jesus' way. Let's turn to the story of the resurrection. 
Our reading for this morning comes from the Gospel of John, the 20th chapter. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other, and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of the linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that she had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord.
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Amen. Friends, we're going to receive the Lord's Supper. When you came in, you should have received one of these small chalices. On one side's bread, on one side is wine. I'll instruct you when to receive that. But first, I want to draw your attention to some words in our reading today. When the disciples, Peter and the disciple Jesus loved, just spoiler alert, that's John, the author of this gospel. They see the tomb empty. They see and they believe. But they don't yet understand what's really going on. And later, Jesus says to the disciple who doubted, blessed are they who have not seen and yet believe. Friends, that's part of the Christian walk. Belief comes before understanding. Not I need to understand this so that I, so that I can believe it. I believe and understanding comes. It's the same with this meal. We believe that in this meal, Jesus imparts himself to us in his very body and his very blood for forgiveness, life, and salvation. You can give yourself a headache trying to figure that one out. But this is the man who rose from the dead. This is God and man who won victory by overcoming death. So when he says, take and eat, this is my body. Take and drink, this is my blood. We can take him at his word. And if we can take him at his word, we can take his promises for his word. That this is for you, for your forgiveness, for your assurance of salvation. So I ask, is Christ risen? Amen. Then come, the table is prepared for you, the people of God. It says in Scripture that our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. This do in remembrance of me. So take and eat. This is the true body of Christ given unto death for you. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So take and drink. This is the true blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Now may this true body and this true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ keep you strong and steadfast in the true faith from this day unto life everlasting. Christ's peace and Christ's joy are yours. Amen. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen
The Lord is risen. He is risen the Lord is risen. He is risen Two billion people around the world today are gathered to acclaim that single truth. Over a third of the world acclaims the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so you need to know you're in wonderful company today. People everywhere are claiming that Jesus, in fact, rose from the dead. It is the single fact to which all of Christianity hangs on. As Paul said in Corinthians, if Jesus is not risen from the dead, our faith is futile. But now has Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of all of those who have ever fallen asleep and will ever fall asleep. So I've got great news for you today. We're going to talk about that Jesus because what he means for our life is significant and life-changing and eternal. We've been looking at the Lord's Prayer for the last six weeks. And it's an interesting way of understanding that when Jesus teaches the disciples the Lord's Prayer, what he's actually, what he's teaching them is every single time you pray it, you are making a declaration of the world you choose to live in. There is the kingdom of God and there's the kingdom of this world. Well, the kingdom of God represented here and the kingdom of this world represented here. So Satan has one plan for our life and God our Father has a different plan for our life. And so when we gather, we say our Father in heaven. That's where we stand. That's where we live. But all too often, we are so tempted to say our Father, the Father of lies, the Father of deception, the Father and the King of this world, Satan. That's where so often we find ourselves living. And so as we live our lives each day, you and I choose which kingdom we live in. And in the Lord's Prayer, we begin by saying, no, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. And so we end today with this incredible doxology written about the fourth century and then added to the Lord's Prayer. And I want to walk you through that and what that means for our life, specifically on Easter Sunday. So it begins with, for thine is the kingdom. Thine is the kingdom. What is he saying? He's saying, I as your father am king. I rule over everything. And I want you to never get that blurred in your mind that I am the king. Because there is another one who sets himself up as king of your life. What's interesting is when you and I come to life, when we're born, God made this decision. He made the decision actually in the Garden of Eden. And he gave us a gift, the gift of a crown. It's actually his, his crown. And he says, when you live on this earth, I'm giving to you rulership and dominion so that you can live under my authority. And so we have this crown. And when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we make the decision who wears the crown. So often, you and I give that crown away. We give it to, to people, people that we want to, to have authority over us or to rule us or people we want to become like. People that we think they have great advice and they can really inform how we live our life. And we give them that crown and say, we will listen to you. We will honor you. So often we, we give it to Satan. When the temptations come, we say, hey, hey that sounds pretty good. I'm going to give you the crown because obviously you know what I want and you can give me that. All too often, however... We wear the crown ourselves. 
I get to do what I want. No one can tell me anything different. I'm in charge of my own destiny. I don't need anyone else. And I definitely don't need a savior. Listen to what Jesus has to say about that. He says, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rodents destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rodent do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, where your treasure is, where you put your stuff, where you write your checks, where you buy your properties, wherever your treasure is, the time you spend with people who you want to rule over you and influence you. He says, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And then he gives this incredible insight. None of us can serve two masters. You don't get both kings. Either you hate the one and love the other, or you are devoted to one and you despise the other. You cannot serve God and money, the kingdom of earth. You're like, yes, I can. Sure, I can. I can have a little of this and a little of that. And before you know it, you got a whole lot of this and not very much of that. Storage units. You know how many storage units there are in the world? 52,000 storage units worldwide. 46,000 of those storage units are in America. 6,000 of those storage units are in Texas. Texas has 10% of all the storage units in the world. Something tells me we can say that's our king, but this rules over us. Stuff has a hold of us. We live for stuff, and when we've stuffed our garages and our attics and we still have stuff, we stuff it in storage units. Why? Because we serve this. Somehow we think this and whatever this is, cars, boats, houses, uh, titles, job promotions, whatever that is, that's really what we strive for, even though we know this is what God has called us to. So here's the point of today's sermon. Have a garage sale. Get rid of your stuff and get it out of the United States to someone else. We hate that reputation. So now this is Jesus speaking to the disciples because he recognizes this. He recognizes how you and I are building a kingdom on this earth. How somehow we believe that this is all there is. That this is life and we've got to do whatever we can to make this life the best possible life. And so we strive and we worry and we're filled with anxiety and stress because we believe that this is going to last. Now let me tell you what he says to his disciples. He says, nations, by the way, just listen to these words and think about our world. Nations will rise against nations and kingdoms will rise against kingdoms. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilence in various places. Fearful events and great signs from heaven. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that the desolation is near. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out. Let those in the country not enter. For this is the time of punishment and fulfillment of all that has been written. There will be great distress in the land and the wrath of people. They will fall by the sword. They will be taken as prisoners in all of the nations. Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the time of the heavens are fulfilled. There will be signs. In the sun, 
solar eclipse. In the moons, in the stars, on the earth, nations will be in anguish and great confusion at the roaring and the tossing of the seas, climate change. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming of the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And at that time, we will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and great glory. And when you see these things take place, stand up and lift up your hands because your redemption is drawing near. What is he saying? This stuff is going away. This has no lasting life. It's temporary. It's just something that we try to find pleasure and joy in. But there is a time coming where you're going to see the chaos of the world begin to surround you. And he is saying, this is normal. When you read the paper, go, this is normal. This is what the father of this world does. He sucks us in and makes us think, this life is going to be great. And Jesus is saying, no, it isn't. It's going away, and it's going to go away with great terror and great judgment. What is he saying? Heaven wins. Heaven is the victory. So when you position yourself over here, you have chosen the wrong kingdom. Thine is the kingdom. So my question is this. is yours. What are you going to do with it? Who are you crowning as ruler? The stuff you have? The stress you feel? The fear you own? The world and all that it's coming to? Is that where you're placing your crown? Is that what you're living for? Is that what you're striving for? Is a better life? Or are you willing to set it on the word of God where Jesus says, I am the victory. I am the winner. My kingdom will last forever. Thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power There's this incredible passage in the scripture that says, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. He's the strength of God and the discernment of God. And yet we live under this weird illusion, don't we? That somehow we have the power. We have the power to make whatever choice we want. We have the power to decide whoever we want to be. We even get to decide our pronouns. We get to decide everything these days. It's all up to us. We wear our crown really, really fashionably. Or we give our crown away to Fox News or MSNBC to define our reality, our culture. We give it away to our bosses who tell us what to do with our jobs and how to strive. We give it away to our children. They have the power. They set our schedule. They tell us how to spend our resources. We give it away to our doctors. And whatever they say is true. Who has the power in your life. There's a story in the Old Testament. A guy by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. And he wore the crown. He was fully convinced that he was in control of everything. He was in control. This is not comfortable at all. It is, this doesn't fit. It's good. Um, 
he was, he was firmly believing that everything was under his rule. Every nation, every person, every power. He was in charge of everything. And here's what happens. The Lord sends him out into a wilderness to teach him a lesson. And he says, you are going to stay in that wilderness away from all of your power until you realize you are powerless. He says, the most high is sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. His dominion is an eternal dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. And all the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. Nebuchadnezzar, you're not in charge. Your political party is not in charge. Your teachers are not in charge. Your bosses are not in charge. They may think they are. You are not in charge. He says, all the people of the earth are regarded as nothing, no power. He does as he pleases with all of his power in heaven and over the peoples of the earth. And no one can hold back his hand. The same power that brought Jesus from the grave, that power lives in you. You have that power, not because of your greatness, not because of your skill or expertise or wisdom. You have that power because the power that was in Jesus that raised him from the dead lives in you. Now, here's what's an interesting thought for me. Why the heck was the stone rolled away? Have you ever thought of that? Why was the stone rolled away? It's the symbol of Easter. It was a symbol up there. It's the symbol of Easter that the stone is rolled away. Why? Did it have to be rolled away so he could get out? That night we realized that he just transitions through walls. The grave was not open so he could get out. The grave was opened so you could come in. That's why it was there. He needed you to believe that his power is real and his power is for you. You know, I think a lot of us in life have closed tombs. We have stones over things that are dead in our life. We have stones over our marriage, stones over our kids, stones over our fears, stones over our bank account, stones over our health. And inside is death and destruction and fear and wounds and heartache and anxiety. And Easter rolls away that stone. And Jesus comes in and says, you better get out of there. There's nothing in there that you need to see anymore. Whatever you thought was overcoming you, whatever you thought that you had no power over, you're wrong. The world will tell you have, you have no power. But he's saying, I'm saying that the resurrection power that came in me comes into you. You have the power of resurrection that lives in you to overcome whatever is in the tomb of your life. He says this, but you belong to God. You have already won the victory because of the one who lives in you. I want you to hear this. You have already won the victory because the one who lives in you, the one who lives in you, is greater than the one who lives in the world. Satan will tell you all day long you're defeated. Satan will tell you all day long your marriage is over. Satan will tell you all day long you can't change. Satan will tell you your wounds and your hurts are all from your past and they're always going to be with you. No. And all these things... We are conquerors through him who loved us and gave us the power to hope and believe in his power in our life. This is Paul's prayer. 
for his Christians. He said, I pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of his power for those who believe. This is the same mighty power that raised Jesus from the dead and is seated in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Thine is the power. I would say that to you today. Thine is the power. This is yours. Who are you going to give power to? Who are you going to give hope to? Who are you going to give answers to? Who will you bow down to? It either goes here, and the promises of the father of lies, or it goes here with the promises of our father who aren't in heaven. And the prayer ends. For thine is the glory forever and ever. One day, every single person who has ever had life in them, one day, every single person who has ever lived on the earth, one day, every single person who has ever drawn a breath will proclaim that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let me give you the Bible passage. It says, have this mind in you, which was yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. Took on the form of a human. He took on the form of a servant and being born, born in the likeness of men, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed a name that is above every other name so that at the name of Jesus, one day, Every knee will confess, every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. You know what's unique? Is one day, the Bible is saying, one day, we will all take the crown. The crown that we have placed on others, the crown we have placed on ourselves, and when we see him face to face, it says we will lay our crowns before him because he is the glory of God the Father. The Lord is risen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time and this moment. We thank you for your resurrection, from coming out of death to life to give us life out of our death. We thank you for your rulership over the kingdom of heaven, which you have called us to live in. We thank you for rescuing us, Lord, from the kingdom of this earth, which brings such destruction into our life. God, we thank you that you invite us to live daily in your kingdom. To experience daily your power over our sin and our death. And that one day we will behold face to face the glory of Jesus for all that you have done. So now, Lord, Gather our hearts and our voices as we proclaim the kingdom we desire to live in. As we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord is risen. And that means your life will be forever changed. I hope you can come back with us and join us next Sunday. We're starting a new series called Portraits. How do you and I begin to imitate the life of Jesus as he lives it out through people just like you? It's going to be a glorious day. It's going to be a glorious morning for uh, eggs and food. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining in the resurrection power of the one who has given us life. Would you please stand for this morning's blessing? Here's what Jesus says. I will bless you and I will keep you. I will make my face shine on you and I will be gracious to you and I will look upon you with my favor and I will give you peace. So go. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Love you.
Thank you. 